Hello. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming. I'd like to call to order this special meeting of the Pleasanton Housing Commission. And we usually start, and we're going to start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, could we do the roll call, please, Miss Edith? Thank you. Thank you. Commissioners Kate Duggan? Here. Colleen Fisher? Here. Zarina Kisalolo? I'm here. Neil Kripalani? Here. Tony Sobey? Here. Chairperson Jake Galvin? Here. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Uh, we only have one item on the agenda tonight, and I understand that we, we have a speaker card. And I think we're going to wait till after the presentation for the uh, speaker, and because we're going to assume that the speaker wants to comment on the presentation, unless there's some something else there. Uh, that that's the explanation for the for the agenda a slight change the only item on the agenda tonight is review and provide recommendations for the draft housing site selection criteria for the sixth cycle of the housing element so i'll turn it over to steve and whoever you're turning it over to from there <laughs> good evening commissioner as commissioners I will actually turn this over to uh, Ellen uh, and her planning team. Ellen? Thank you, Steve. Um, good evening, commissioners. Um, uh, thank you uh, very much for uh, this special meeting this evening for this uh, important topic, uh, one of our early discussions in the housing element update, which is a uh, review of our initial um, draft site selection criteria. Um, proposed as a first step in the very important process of selecting the sites for inclusion uh, in our updated uh, housing element. So tonight, oh, I'm sorry, I'm going to share my screen before I forget. I'm sorry about that. Hopefully you can all see that. Um, so, sorry. Um, so tonight I'll be um, starting with a short overview of, of where we're at in the housing element process and how the site selection will fit into that. Um, I'll also outline in a little bit more depth the initial uh, list of site selection criteria before opening up for planning commission questions, uh, public comment, and then finally housing commission discussion and input. Um, we'll be meeting tomorrow night with our planning commission and we'll be uh, able to report back uh, what we hear from the commission at tonight's meeting so that they can take that into consideration as they review and make their recommendation on the site selection criteria as well. Um, so just a bit of a reminder of where the site selection fits into our overall housing element process. You recall, we gave you a, a presentation a few weeks ago, just really giving you a big picture of the overall process. We outlined in that meeting um, some of the key um, uh, components or elements of, of the housing element. And one of them that's uh, important and is, is uh, really part of tonight's discussion is the identification of an adequate sites inventory. Um, and that's the list of land that's suitably zoned to accommodate the city's share of our regional housing need. And I'll talk a little bit more about, about that number, just to remind you of what that, um, what, that, what that is and what that means in the housing element process. Um, so just backing up for a moment to our overall schedule, you can see in red um, where we're at in our current process. Um, we're here sort of about a third of the way through the process, looking at the site's inventory. Um, we're also um, uh, sort of on another track, doing some work to develop background information, as well as to conclude and summarize the initial phase of our public outreach process. And by starting our site selection pr process early, that gives us a lot of time and the necessary time to integrate review of the sites into our CEQA process that will be happening uh, in the first part of next year, and to go through a very deliberate process of discussion review and vetting 
uh, for the final list of sites that ultimately will be integrated into the housing element for adoption in, uh, in January of 2023. So quick reminder on, on our, our arena number. Uh, this is a number that's beginning to be burned into my brain, um, 5,965 units. And that's the number that the state um, through the uh, ABAG um, regional COG pro process has allocated to Pleasanton on a draft basis, at least for now, as our, as our um, number of units that we need to, to plan for, to identify sites for uh, in our housing element update. And as you, as you can see, those, uh, those units are allocated into a number of different affordability categories, ranging from very low to above moderate. Um, and those collectively comprise that 5,965 unit target um, that we must show that we have um, land available to accommodate. So um, moving on into the actual site selection criteria itself, um, wanted to give a little bit of a, just kind of a sense of, of, of how this sort of all adds up. So as I mentioned, the housing element must identify adequate sites for, uh, to meet our, our arena. Um, that existing inventory, oh, and we start really with an existing inventory of what we have zoned today, and that's sort of our baseline of residential capacity that we have um, to accommodate additional housing. We compare that to the total arena, sort of do that math of, of, of deducting that existing um, yield of sites based on existing zoning from the arena, and the difference between those two numbers is the gap that we need to solve by identifying additional new sites for housing. Um, in the last cycle, we had enough sites zoned or identified, and so we didn't need to go through this process. In the prior cycle, we did. And so as I'll, as I'll cover in just a minute, um, it's the fourth cycle, the, the one that was two, two, two cycles ago, that's really the basis for our current process and our current um, sort of thinking about the criteria that we'll be using. Um, we've, we've begun the process to analyze that existing baseline of units that we have existing zoning for. Um, and our initial rough estimate is that we have a, a minimum, minimal gap of about 1,500 very low and low income units to find sites for and about 2000 moderate and above moderate uh, income units. And I'll caveat those numbers pretty, pretty heavily by saying we're still, uh, we're still working on the analysis. Um, there's still some, uh, some fine tuning to do, but that's um, I think a rough order of magnitude um, estimate of, of the sort of uh, number of units that we have to solve for through additional sites. So the site selection process, um, as I outlined in the agenda report, will be, will be, will be deliberate and will follow a number of, of really important steps uh, during each of which there will be opportunities for, for public review and input. Um, today, we're at step one, uh, identifying the criteria for the initial evaluation of the sites. Um, as I mentioned, we're continuing to work on that um, evaluation of our existing sort of base of units that we have uh, with existing zoning, and that work will proceed over the next uh, month or so to really dial that number in. Um, then we will um, use the, uh, the criteria that have been developed at tonight's meeting and, and with the Planning Commission and, and, and Council over the, the next couple of weeks. Uh, to, um, to vet those sites, to rank and to score them. Those will be brought back into additional rounds of discussion later this year. Um, and then that list will basically form the um, sort of the inventory of sites that we'll take through our environmental or CEQA analysis uh, in the first part of next year. And then uh, once the CEQA analysis is complete, um, and, and everything is sort of wrapped up, there will be a final opportunity uh, for discussion with our commissions, with the city council and with the public to choose the final list of sites for inclusion in our housing element um, at the end of 2022. So sort of a, the, the graphic on the right is meant to really illustrate that sort of filtering process. We're starting with a very big list of sites and that will gradually get uh, winnowed down and whittled down through uh, the subsequent rounds of discussion. So as I mentioned, um, the fourth cycle, which was two cycles ago, was the last time that we really had to focus uh, intensively on finding new and additional sites. Um, it was a process that involved um, uh, our housing, a housing element task force, as well as input from our, from our commissions, from the public, numerous public meetings. And so since those criteria were really, um, and that framework was really well vetted in the fourth cycle, 
we felt it was a, a good starting point for this six cycle analysis. So um, that said, there are a few differences and, and obviously um, that work was done in 2010, 2011, 10 years later, there's both changes in, in state law and the underlying um, regulations that um, go into and control ultimately, or in part, this, the list of sites that we're able to include our, in our inventory. Um, we know that in this round, um, the Department of Housing and Community Development have additional criteria for sort of scrutinizing those sites and we'll be taking it through a more exacting process of review. Um, at the advice of our consultants, um, we, we looked at the fourth cycle criteria and there were a few of them that were a little, a little squishy, a little subjective. And although there will be, and importantly, will be a, a lot of policy discussion at this very early stage, we really wanted to try and focus on criteria that were objective or measurable um, and that tied back to sort of known criteria and definitions um, to rely on in, in a fairly um, objective manner. And then I think one important thing to note, as I, I touched on just a few minutes ago, is that unlike the fourth cycle, um, we have to find sites for, for market rate housing, for our above moderate housing. And that, that just changes the complexion of things a little bit in that um, we have more options for those above moderate sites in terms of site size, in terms of uh, some of the other parameters that are, are required are a little bit less, uh, less rigorous for the above moderate sites. Um, so it's just, it is a broader range of sites that we have to find uh, and look at collectively. And that influences the nature of some of the criteria as well. So the fourth cycle and those uh, it's, carried, it's carried through to the sixth cycle analysis. Um, we were, were driven by a set of four guiding principles um, that were adopted by the housing element task force. And we looked at them again and found them to be good and valid um, basis for uh, sort of formulating our, our housing element criteria. Uh, the first of them was general plan policy conformance and particularly a focus on two um, themes in our general plan, sustainability, environmental sustainability, um, as well as community character, meaning, you know, having development that's compatible with our built environment, with our neighborhoods, with our natural environment, um, with our, uh, you know, local aesthetics and things like that. So that's one principle that's woven into the criteria. Um, principles of smart growth, um, that's a term that really refers to the effort to plan in a way that's sustainable by doing things like placing uh, higher density uh, development near, near transit or places where people can, uh, can bicycle or walk to, uh, to shopping and services, um, clustering development in infill sites rather than pushing it out to greenfield sites in the periphery. Um, a third criteria was, was very significant in the fourth cycle, um, continue to imp be important today. And that's this, uh, which you, you all may be familiar with as, as the Housing Commission, the uh, California tax credit allocation criteria. Um, that, that, that program known as TCAC is one of the principal uh, funding sources for affordable housing um, in particular. And to the extent that this housing element will need to um, affirmatively provide opportunities for, uh, for fair housing, for, for lower income uh, families and households, that um, aligning criteria to the sorts of considerations that are important and make projects competitive for grant funding or for tax credit programs like TCAC um, is really important in this process. And then finally, as I mentioned, um, state law and HCD regulations and guidance are also an important input. So um, moving on a little bit to the, to the actual scoring framework, we have a total of 33 criteria in seven discrete categories. Um, I didn't go back and count how many were in the fourth cycle criteria, but we deleted a few, we added a few, we're probably about the same number of criteria overall around 30 to 35. Um, the, the criteria are really, and I'll get to this a little bit more in, in, a, in a moment, are framed in a relatively simple way as sort of yes, no answers, a single point is scored for every yes answer, and on aggregate, those scores are used then to, um, to, rank, to rank sites or to create that initial ranking. Um, as I mentioned, we're, we're striving for object, objectivity in, our, in those criteria to the extent possible. 
And I wanted to reiterate, this is really a first pass analysis. So none of the criteria are really fatal flaws. Um, although the, um, the ranking that comes out of this will be um, important guidance and help to understand relative quality of sites relative to the criteria that we've developed, we understand that there will be um, a very important set of discussions around, um, around policy as we look strategically about um, potential density on each of these sites, where sites should go, what the overall distribution of sites in the city looks like so they're not overly concentrated in one portion of the city or another, um, uh, and that uh, we're, we're sort of meeting whatever other policy objectives come in in terms of perhaps neighborhood compatibility and things like that. Um, and as I mentioned, CEQA evaluation, the really de detailed technical environmental review, as well as review by HCD are, are, are both important screenings that will happen in the process as well. So the seven categories I mentioned, I won't go through them in depth, I'm gonna cover them in just a second, are um, outlined on this slide here, and I'll move on to um, the, the sites, the, sorry, the criteria themselves, and those are included in your, uh, in your packet. Um, at the request of one of our planning commissioners, um, I was asked to provide a comparison between the fourth cycle and sixth cycle. So if you're curious about exactly what changed, um, what uh, sort of wordsmithing was done between um, the criteria between this cycle and last cycle, that's an attachment to the memo that was distributed uh, to you earlier today. Right. Um, so very briefly, um, the first category, site size and info criteria. This is the one that perhaps focuses the most on what the, the state requires of us, especially for higher, uh, higher density sites. Um, and that's reflected in these minimum and maximum site requirements, as well as the second criteria, which is really about um, the opportunity through a larger site to have more flexibility and in site planning, uh, which is the reason for criteria two. Infill, as I mentioned, uh, an important goal uh, from a sustainability perspective and an efficiency of, of land use. So uh, putting um, new housing uh, within the existing urbanized area of the city versus on the outskirts, for example. And then the fourth criteria is one that's in, uh, in state law guidance about there being available um, infrastructure to serve, uh, to serve these sites. The second set of criteria are around transportation. Um, you can see that several of them focus on transit, um, including proximity to BART, proximity to, uh, to bus lines that have a minimum frequency of service in the, uh, in the, in the commute hours, uh, adjacency to uh, bicycle facilities, um, simply because when people have more access to the bike network, they will tend to drive less and use uh, bicycling for more of their day-to-day -day trips and activities. Um, and then uh, because we know that most people will continue to, to drive and to uh, potentially to commute that um, convenient freeway access to reduce the amount of crosstown uh, travel that's needed um, is, is one of our criteria as well. Third category is about services and amenities. Um, this one is, is, I think, probably one of the criteria that's most aligned to the TCAC tax credit um, criteria, which is very focused on placing housing near where services are, are convenient. So um, to proximity to grocery stores, um, to elementary, elementary, middle, and high schools, and a new, a new criteria that I wanted to add it, add, wanted to emphasize um, that came out of some input that we heard from our, um, I, I believe from the Housing Commission, also from our, our uh, council as well, was concern that you know, new housing doesn't overburden already schools that already have, have capacity issues or, or may have pro projected capacity issues in the future. So we'll be working with PUSD to um, really pinpoint those sites um, and again, none of these are fatal flaws because there's, you know, there's often a solution, whether it's redistricting or, you know, longer term building a new ele elementary school, not necessarily an unsolvable problem, but certainly a consideration in our housing element site selection. Um, and then finally, uh, proximity to parks and, and open space. Um, the fourth criteria is about environmental impacts. These are uh, fairly uh, self-explanatory. Obviously, we, we don't want to expose future residents to, uh, to noisy, polluting, smelly environments. And there's a few um, locations in town that have those sorts of characteristics. 
Um, and so um, these criteria reflect that. Um, we also have a number of criteria around natural hazards. So obviously not exposing people to floods, earthquakes, and those sorts of risks, um, fire hazard, and so on. Uh, the fifth criteria, as it says, um, uh, it's about redevelopment of sites and whether or not that would affect sensitive resources like, um, like heritage trees, um, uh, biological resources and habitat, or historic resources. Um, the sixth criteria is about neighborhood compatibility. So comparing um, potentially a higher density, taller building to what's around it and scoring more positively those that would have um, a relationship to buildings around it where there's more consistency in size. So not placing very large buildings next to a lot of uh, smaller single family homes, for example. And similarly with floor area ratio, which is a measure of intensity of development, uh, doing a similar comparison there. Um, and then finally, the, the, the third criteria in, in, in category six is about um, just proximity to single family residential neighborhoods and recognizing that there's um, sensitivity and need for care when thinking about placing perhaps higher density housing in those uh, near those neighborhoods to be sensitive to the existing development and character of those neighborhoods. And then finally, um, interest in site, and this is a uh, criteria that's intended to reflect the, the benefit of having an, a, perhaps a property owner who's, who's interested and motivated to develop a site with housing. Um, I did want to note, and it's, it's stated in your agenda report, that that property owner approval or permission or agreement is not required um, for, for any of our, our sites because we have arena that's over 5,000 units. Um, nonetheless, understanding that many of our sites may involve redevelopment of existing non-vacant sites, sites that have you know, something built on them today, HCD will tend to scrutinize those more carefully. And so um, having um, property owner agreement is a way that we can help to make the case to HCD when we're bringing forward a site that might already have, you know, say an existing shopping center or an existing commercial building on it, that um, it is, suitable for, for housing. So not a prerequisite for HCD, but a sort of a helpful input to their, um, to the case that we may be trying to make for some of these sites. Um, so that really outlines the, uh, this, this, the sites. And obviously we can come back and, and talk and discuss those in a lot more depth. I just wanted to give you a, a flavor of those, um, of those 33 criteria. Um, I did want to acknowledge comments that we've received uh, in advance of this meeting. We received one, one uh, comment in the form of a joint letter from a group uh, that includes East Bay for Everyone, Greenbelt Alliance, uh, Genesis, which is a local community organization, and uh, the Tri-Valley Anti-Poverty Collaborative. Uh, they together wrote a letter um, um, which has been shared with the Housing Commission um, uh, sort of seeking to emphasize really criteria that help to support affordable housing, like the TCAC type criteria that I just that I just noted, um, as well as ones that are more environmentally uh, sustainable, such as infill sites. And then we received also two other comments from members of the public. Uh, I think believe one of them was a speaker tonight as well, um, with a number of ideas and considerations for the commission on um, how to be thinking about. Uh, the site selection process, as well as housing sites opportunities. Um, so just to touch briefly on what's next, um, we, as I mentioned, we will be reporting uh, your comments from tonight's meeting to our planning commission tomorrow night. Uh, the housing commission will be making a recommendation to the, to the city council who will be considering the site's criteria uh, in September. Um, as I mentioned, we're continuing to work on our land inventory as well as to gather our list of prospective sites, that, that very, I'll call it the long list, the laundry list of sites that, that may be sort of in the running for uh, consideration for to be new housing sites. Um, and so that work is going to continue in the background. However, uh, work still needs to advance on other pieces of the housing element, including um, uh, the, the policy the policy considerations around housing programs, as well as the, uh, the background technical report um, that we're just calling the draft preliminary report that encompasses the housing needs assessment, um, a constraints analysis um, that we're required to, 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 to undertake, as well as a review of our existing policies and programs. 
Um, and that will be coming back to the Housing Commission, Planning Commission, and City Council in um, September and October. So we'll sort of be shifting gears a little bit for our next meeting and then returning towards the end of the year, as I mentioned, with um, the comprehensive analysis of our site screening results, um, alternatives uh, for consideration so that we can um, identify that initial sites list for inclusion in the, in the CEQA analysis starting in, in early 2022. Um, so for those watching tonight, just wanted to put up our slide that, that says how you can stay in touch with the housing element process. We have a housing element website, uh, www.pleasantonhousingelement.com. Um, we have an email, um, and Jennifer Hagen, our associate planner's uh, contact information is posted here too. Um, and she's our primary point of contact for the public with any questions that might come up on, on the housing element, um, at any point in the process. Um, so with that, that, that concludes my presentation. Um, we would recommend that the Housing Commission tonight uh, review, provide comments on the draft initial sites criteria to be used in the ranking, scoring, and selection sites for the six cycle housing element update. Um, we would certainly invite your questions um, as well as following public comment, um, dis your discussion and input on the housing, um, housing site selection criteria. So thank you, I'll, I'll conclude my presentation there. Thank you. Um, Steve, do we want to let everybody go around and make an initial statement? For, or do we want to let the member of the public, which may be Becky Dennis, speak next? What What's the... Yeah, uh, uh, Chair Galvin, we can probably uh, let that speaker speak first. I think that's fine. <laughs> There, okay. Hello. <laughs> Hello, Becky. Hi. Um, well, you have a letter from Jocelyn Combs and myself. And uh, the main purpose of us wanting to speak to you is to encourage a couple of things in your thinking. One is to uh, really stretch on allowable sites, for instance, uh, Jocelyn had many ideas, and uh, I think uh, if you explore the idea of air rights over commercial parking lots, or you know, we might find some partners for development uh, by uh, really going to the edge of the envelope, as it were. I've been involved in uh, the, a number of housing elements in the past, and uh, what's really great about this one is that we're doing the climate action plan at the same time. And previously housing elements uh, were all about jobs, housing balance, traffic mitigation, pollution prevention. But now it's really about the important issue of climate change and it affects everybody. So uh, I think the speaking about the uh, tremendous progress we can make in greenhouse gas reduction, through the provision of service housing in Pleasanton will help the public understand exactly what it is we're doing and why it's important. Um, I don't know what the other uh, folks have submitted. I'd love to see correspondence as we go through this process published with the staff report so that everybody can kind of see what everybody else is saying. Uh, that would be very helpful. Um, I think, uh, you know, the sustainability question is really fundamental when we go through and we look at sites, what, what are the, uh, what are the uh, emissions impacts of housing? You know, for the people that are, that are commuting out in the moderate and above moderate housing, uh, how, how can we assure that that housing does not add to our burden? One of the ways is of course, to remember the site selections uh, being near transit, being infill, uh, and being near bike paths, because eventually people may move from the lower income income housing into that housing and still, you know, wish to remain in the city as they climb the housing ladder. So think long term, use your imagination. You know, I think uh, at least uh, Jocelyn and I will be there to say we think it's a good idea for you not to put undue restrictions on but do pay attention to the 
uh, greenhouse gas emissions impacts of the site selection. I think that that is really key. And that's all I had to say. If you have any questions for me, you know, you can ask them now, or I encourage you to call me uh, or Jocelyn if you'd like to chat further. I'm glad to be involved in the process. I think it's going to be a I have high hopes for this particular housing element, as difficult as it is. Sometimes constraints result in great solutions. Okay, thank thank you. you. Any uh, questions for Ms. Dennis? <clears throat> thank you. Uh, Sir, do Sir appreciate Galvin, excuse oh. me, sorry, before, before we uh, go to questions, I, I, did, I, I, I realized I, I neglected to introduce our, our consultants who are here tonight um, <laughs> at the start of my presentation. So I want to acknowledge we have, um, Jen Marillo um, and uh, uh, David Bergman from Lisa Wise Consulting here tonight uh, to help support any um, information or, or background or technical questions that we have. So I wanted to, to, to acknowledge that they're here tonight and uh, available to assist with questions that the commission might have. So apologies for the interruption. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anything else for uh, Ms. Dennis? Everybody? got the two, those two emails, right? Um, Steve, did we establish that the third email that uh, Ms. Clark mentioned, that the joint ma message from- I was gonna uh, ask about that one too. Genesis. Did, did you get it, Kate? No, I was gonna ask about that. We got okay. the two, we did not get the joint one from hey. Genesis. I, I just reforwarded that that email to, to uh, like that comment letter to to Steve, and so I hope he can pass it along to you all, perhaps even during this meeting, if not immediately afterwards. Okay. Um, uh, I apologize if I had a part in uh, delaying getting that to you. Um, Thank you. I have a question. If no one has, sure. Uh, is she is she still here? Is Becky still here? No. No, it looks like she just left. She just left. Oh, there she is. Her oh, hands up. I'm here. <laughs> okay. All right. Hi, Becky. Uh, so I have a question. So I'm not familiar with the uh, air rights over private, uh, privately owned parking lot and how that affects the, uh, please educate me on that process and how that affects the um, moderate income and uh, housing development. Well, it's, um, it's a... Uh... It's an area that's more used on the East Coast. They do it a lot in New York. Um, and I've been curious about it ever since we started planning housing around the BART station because that's public land. I thought, well, you know, maybe we can build over the parking. You know, maybe there's a way to do that. Uh, because if you go multi-story, uh, you know, and, and actually in Massachusetts, they do it a lot too. They build over the highways there, uh, over the turnpike. So it's a bridge and there's a building on the bridge and you go under the building. Uh, so it would be novel in California uh, and I'm not sure it would work, but I wanted to see uh, if there was the possibility of doing affordable housing in that format. And unfortunately, it's not, it doesn't generate a lot of affordable housing because it's kind of expensive to build over things. However, uh, it does generate above moderate income housing and, and some moderate income housing. And we need sites for that as well. So uh, it, it's something that we have not considered as a city and I'm not an expert in it. I just know that it has been done and it's a way to create building spaces where none really exist at the ground level. So uh, I'd, I'd be happy to forward you the small amount of research I did on the you know, how much affordability it generates, but I'm sure that we could find uh, somebody who could tell the city whether that was even feasible or not. I just know we need space. So thinking of every way I can to, to look for it. There's yeah. a, a new creative way to find parking up in San Ramon. They put the parking on the roof uh -huh. at, at new city, uh, city center. Hmm. So on the next point, bullet point, you talked about two hotel plant uh, for JDEDZ, affordable housing. So were you thinking of the hotels in Pleasanton, I'm assuming, right? Yes, yes. Not Which the Costco, but I was thinking 
you know, if the hotels did not come to pass and I included a link there for a report that shows a, a softening in the demand for new hotel rooms, you know, if that would be an opportunity if it came up or the city could possibly, I, I don't know what our relationship is on that property with the developer of the hotels, but that I think would be a great affordable housing site. It's near Costco, it's near Commercial Circle, it's near the highway, it's near Stone Ridge Mall, and it's, it's near the business park uh, and it's five acres. So uh, if you could build hotels there that were accommodating and pleasant, I think you could probably build some pretty attractive uh, uh, low income, very low income housing for service workers there that, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with that site really, but it just, uh, I think the city was thinking of the, uh, of the TOT tax and the annual uh, of that, which of course is important, but also uh, it's an opportunity that we could uh, use to reduce costs elsewhere by having to put our housing requirements in infill, you know, it, it just could work out. So I wanted to mention it, it might be a little bit of a third rail, but I wouldn't take out Costco. That's the real third rail. I would uh, use the hotel sites instead if I had my druthers. And the other side, you talked about the property on for very low, very low income for the uh, city owned property, I guess on final property. Correct. That would need that would need voter approval, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'm, you know, I don't know. There's a lot of city-owned property there. It's possible that three to five acres would not be missed. Uh, hasn't the, nobody has asked the community what they think of that uh, in a long time since the property was approved by the voters. Uh, but affordable housing was a priority at the time that the property was being planned. But uh, when the property was approved, it was approved with a requirement that no additional housing other than what was approved could be added without a vote of the people. But I think depending on what our choices are going forward, I, uh, I, my position would be that it doesn't hurt to ask, you know, uh, if, if there could be a site. I remember the people that wanted to add affordable housing there were doing it up near the senior center part of the Brunel property because there are resources there. So um, that was a little bit of, again, creative thinking that had not, uh, oh, I, someone else did mention it once to say, gee, maybe we should actually look at that. And, uh, you know, I'm for looking at everything. I think it's, uh, I, I think it's our, a great opportunity for us to do that with the new needs that we have. Yeah. Thank you. Well, one last thing, Becky. Uh, yes. You're not for East Pleasanton. That doesn't look like it. And I don't think East Pleasanton qualifies for this arena cycle for specifically low-income housing. No, not for low income. It would yeah. it's it's being looked at as a moderate and above moderate income site. I just, you know. Uh, previously, I had really been in favor of that uh, as a development for affordable housing, but I went through the East Pleasanton specific plan process. I did an analysis of the like 12 different options that they put forward. It's very expensive to develop that site because it does not have infrastructure and it requires the re-engineering of all the soils to make the, make it stable. All the, all the uh, uh, quarry companies did was just put dirt in the hole, you know, so that all has to be re-engineered. And that meant that the site couldn't be developed in anything other than fairly high-end housing. Even the high density little portion that they had near the small commercial center they planned only uh, generated a very few affordable units. So um, I was thinking that that's not a great place. On the other hand, it's it's zoned commercial and you could do a lot of our climate, our CAP 2.0 projects out there. You could do maybe organics recycling. Uh, I sent uh, the council a, uh, an article I found where they did uh, solar. You know, there's just nothing out there. And 
that could be a place where uh, the moderate and above moderate housing developers could mitigate their impacts back down to zero. In other words, they would be, you know, you'd say, well, you, we'd love to have you, but you need, we don't want to add a burden to our greenhouse gas reduction, but you can uh, be charged a fee. You can make an investment in uh, increasing our capacity for carbon sequestration. It's again, it's an idea. I'll be happy to send you the uh, thing that I sent the council. They had uh, habitat restoration under solar with uh, some small animal grazing uh, in, uh, I forget which state it was, it was back East, but it seemed like a, a fascinating, even money-making idea. So, uh, and it would be easy. You don't have to re-engineer the soil and bring sewer and water to have a solar farm. So. Thank, Thank you for your questions. My goodness, I could go Thank on and on. <laughs> Anything else for her? Becky? I just uh, had a comment with my hands up. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. Commissioner Tony. It's not necessarily a question, but just a comment. I actually, in both letters, the way I see and interpret what I see here, the proposals for various different sites and whatnot, and to think out of the box is all all great, and uh, but I think what we're doing tonight is developing a ranking criteria for evaluating ideas like this. And so I would think it's gonna fall out. So what, what I'm taking these two letters as is, well, let's, I'll be thinking about these things and then they'll be ranked and see how they fall out on the ranking. So hmm. that's kind of the way I'm looking at it. Interesting. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I know we're speaking a little far Serena, out. I, I'd like to wrap up with Becky first. Serena, do you have anything else for Becky? No, thank you. Thank you for you still time. have your hand on. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, anything else? So what I'm going to propose, but Steve, I'm totally open to recommendations if you want something different. Um, would it be appropriate to let each board member give a response or an idea or an input now, or do you want to go through the items one by one and wait for them to come up? Actually, I'm sorry, uh, Steve. Who's running this? <laughs> I mean, Ellen? So, uh, yeah, well, uh, it's your meeting, obviously, Chair, Chair Galvin. I would, um, you know, perhaps one idea might be to go through um, at least uh, category by category and see if the, the commission has any questions or comments about 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 those, you know, each, you know, each of the seven categories. Um, and, and that might be a way to structure your input. Um, Brian, I don't know if you have any other ideas on how to do that. Oh, I think that's fine. I, I don't think it's useful to go through all 30 some odd individually. Mm -hmm. um, we'll be here way too long. Oh, the sun comes up. Right. <laughs> um, but I think Ellen's suggestion is is good. Yeah, so, so we can just go through the seven, sort of the seven high level, and then if you have any particular- um, uh, Actually, I do. I would, could you kindly list the sites? Yeah. And I don't see it on the map, mark, or those the sites that's marked on the map on the last page of the report? No. So just to be clear, at this point, we have not brought forward any particular sites for consideration. So what we're asking the commission to do tonight or the, the help we're asking for is for your input on the criteria that will be used once we have all of the sites, potential sites identified, um, discuss the, the, the criteria that will be used to help initially rank them. And as I mentioned a couple of times, it's, it's, the, it's the first pass. So there'll yeah. be um, a couple of other occasions at least um, during which uh, our, 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 certainly our planning commission council and the public will have the opportunity to review um, the, the site and the site selection criteria as, as well as the housing commission. So sorry okay. to interrupt you. One, one last question, just a clarification question. So the sites, they are, the, if I remember correctly, these are HCD's overall arching criteria. So you've summarized them and put them on these categories that one, two, three, four, five, all these seven sites. And then now you have some idea what 
those uh, where these sites could potentially be located. So you're asking us to basically rank them where you want us. Not, which not, not, not yet. So we're, we're okay. at step one, which is just to define the, the, the evaluation parameters for individual sites when that list of sites comes forward. Okay. So okay. sort of a little bit higher level, a little bit of, about principles and what sort of principles should be applied when the city is considering the most suitable locations for housing in the city. So we're doing that without, we don't have the sites in front of us and that's a deliberate um, decision because it, it, it's trying to get you to think in sort of terms of principles and ideas and um, you know things that are guidance as we select the sites that have the least environmental impacts that are the most compatible with neighborhoods that um, will fit the best into the sorts of criteria that the state is asking us to look at in the process. Okay, so uh, for just a second, I didn't miss a map somewhere, right? No, there's no, there's no okay. map. The only map that, we, that was provided was um, we had had a request from one of our planning commissioners for an understanding of where uh, bus transit is in the city. And so that's the only map that was provided to you tonight. Well, we'll come back to that when we talk about transportation. And therefore, the plan now is we're going to go through the seven categories and we're going to each fill in the form and mail it to you as input, or you're going to try and come to a conclusion based on yeah, this. We're, we're really just asking for, for, your, for your comments and ideas about, um, about the various criteria under each of those categories. Okay. As Brian said, I don't, I don't think it will be uh, time efficient to go through all 30 of the criteria individually, but I think broadly speaking in those categories, if there's anything that pops out at you, um, to say, you know, I just don't, I don't feel this criteria is important. I think this should be, there's something that's missing. I think that's the sort of input that we're looking for me, for you um, tonight. Okay. So for example, on uh, interest site number seven, property owner developer has expressed interest in the site for high density residential development. So for me, that's a given, right? So the city uh, doesn't own a land. Here's a developer who wants to develop his land. So wouldn't that be, great idea uh, to have that as a per first criteria. As so Zarina, I'd like to finish process first. <laughs> so uh, Carlene, I had a question. do you have yeah. something? <laughs> yes. Um, so my question is, um, are we going to at some point determine the demographics that we're dealing with in uh, creating these housing units, for example, if we're, you know, working with, you know, seniors 55 and up, some of these criteria are not going to be as relevant as others that for individual for people that have families. So, uh, when does the demographics come into play, and are we going to get that information at some point? Yeah. So, so we um, one of the the next tasks is actually going to be to bring forward um, some background analysis that provides a sense of what the various housing needs are of, of different groups in our community, including groups like seniors. And that's just sort of really an evaluation of the, the sort of the socioeconomic profile of our community and the kinds of needs right. that might exist. What is unlikely to happen, however, is that we are going to point to a site and say, you know, necessarily that's a site for senior for senior housing, although there might be some that we have a developer who might be interested in coming forward with a senior project, for example. Um, so it's going to be a little bit more organic than that. We're not going to try and build an inventory necessarily targeted at specific populations beyond attempting to meet the affordability goals that the state has set forward for us in, in, the, in the arena. But we will have some distribution as to who are we looking at. How many I think particularly on, on, income, on income level and right. the, the lower income versus the market rate and above right. moderate uh, units. Yes, that will be a really important piece of it. So okay. maybe it'd be helpful for me to bring up the, the list of, of seven criteria and that might help to sort of focus us in a little bit on, on what, we're, um, what we're talking about. So I'm going to try and bring that up. Good but, to start the process here. Yeah. So, that, so, so if this is a, a refresher. This, these are the seven, these are the seven, ca seven scoring categories that, that um, we're recommending. Um, let's get my thing going here. So, uh, and then those, those are in detail. So we can, let's just start with the first one and we can kind of flash through. Um, and I'll just ask the question for this first 
this first criteria, which is really about, so essentially the, the way this would work, right? For every one of these, if, if the site met the criteria, it would get a point. If it didn't, it would get a zero point. Um, and so that, and so on throughout, the, throughout all of the categories. So again, these were selected, the first one based on um, parameters that the state has identified uh, as being important for, for screening sites, especially for higher, higher density housing and lower income housing. Um, infill is an environmental criteria and uh, utilities is just a basic one to say, you know, is this site developable without a lot of additional investment? So any comments on uh, the category one items? This is gonna be a little harder. Go ahead, Kate. Um, sure, I just wanted to clarify A and B. I mean, site is greater than half an acre, less than 10, site is greater than one acre. I don't, I don't really get those or how I'm supposed to understand what one is saying versus the other. So the first one is a literal range that the, the state has defined what, what the state says is sites that are very small are harder to develop and sites that are very large are harder to develop. So they um, will require, the state will require more persuasion that those sites are in fact viable when, when we bring them forward. That's not to say that we can't have a small site or a large site, um, uh, but we have to make the case. So this is just included because it's a screening criteria that HCD applies. Um, the second criteria is sort of extra credit. It's saying you get an extra point if your site is big enough to allow more flexibility in site planning and an acre was decided as a good threshold to, to provide that opportunity. Okay. Yeah. These, are, these are additive, right? They're cumulative points across, uh, across every site will be scored against every one of these criteria and collectively the points score and how well you do against the criteria will be your kind of aggregate um, score for that site. Yeah, I, well, Jay, Jay, I don't want to talk Jay, about it. Go ahead, Tony. Yeah, I, I was thinking, I know 1D sort of uh, gets at the cost issue, but I, I was thinking that there ought to be something in there about uh, the feasibility of actually building it cost-wise. Can a developer build it, or does it have to be a nonprofit that builds it? Uh, you know, because I, I looked at, we got 5,965 homes, units to be built. And I think we identified 3,500 from previous ones. So that's 2,465 that um, have to be built. And some of them may be less costly and more amenable to low income uh, development or all the way up the line. Um, so, so that's my comment. Is yeah. that so? Yeah. So, so Commissioner Commissioner Sobey, I, I'd say I mean that that's a great point. And when we actually have a roster of sites in front of us as a next round of analysis, we will have to analyze um, capacity and constraints. Um, we 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 won't we will possibly not go so far as to look into sort of financial pro forma on these things, but you know if there's a lot of constraints, you know imagine a site that needs a lot of hazardous materials remediation or something. I'm you know making it up, you know that might be a less feasible site because of the cost to develop. But until we actually know where the sites are, those kind of um, overall constraints will be hard to evaluate. So this is really a general. Um, screen just to say, is there, are there utilities to serve the site as just a, a basic test for feasibility? Okay, fair enough. That sounds, sounds right. So that's in the next go round. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Okay. okay. I had just a real quick question. And on the uh, carryover units, the 3,500, are they, will they be rank ordered in using this criteria or are we just carrying them over? Um, we will have to essentially document again those sites um, to confirm that they're still feasible to be developed. Um, and then um, under the state law, because, because those sites have been in included in our last two housing elements, we have to adopt a program that says housing will be allowed by right, you know, without, dis without discretionary review by the city, as long as the project includes a minimum of 20% affordable unit. So that's a extra sort of thing that the state says like, hey, you know, these were clearly a little hard to develop. 
we're going to take away another potential barrier by having a by right zoning um, allowance for existing sites in your inventory, but we can use them again um, next time around. Okay. Uh, okay. And so they'll be evaluated again in this next round. Not well. to the same level of detail, right? Because we've done, we, we did that previously. We vetted them through environmental review. We vetted them through a public process, but we will be sort of just looking at them again and making sure they still pass muster and are still appropriate to include in our, in our inventory. Right. Because like you said, they've been not developed. So there's something that's keeping it from going forward. So that Correct. might be important. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Kate. I just wanted to ask if there was anything or should there be consideration, maybe it's already in here. If the site is already clear right now, there's nothing on it. It's just, you know, empty acreage versus already having structures that you have to infill or convert. Um, is that a consideration or should it be? Um, it, it could be. So vac vacant versus non versus non vacant. And yeah, that, I mean, that is an important criteria for HCD as they review sites um, and determine their feasibility. Um, in, in you know, practical terms, most of our sites are going to be you know, probably not vacant. We just don't have that many truly vacant sites left, but, but that is something that could be added if, if the commission felt it was important and the planning commission agreed. Anybody else? Uh, Serena. So on, uh, so the HCD put this as a criteria that this is the order that they want to see the development of the new, this Reno cycle. And you're asking us to renumber them? No, just, no. That... All of all of these criteria are weighted equally. They're not ranked in importance, um, and that was very deliberate. We didn't try and apply a weighting to them. Again, it's a, this is the first round in the first pass. We're not trying to make it overly complicated, knowing that there's going to be a number of different um, levels of review that are going to happen. This is the first, very first pass. So. Trying to keep it a little bit simple. Um, there's no effort to sort of sort or, or rank um, these criteria. However, they will be used to sort and rank the sites. Yes, correct. So um, a question, do we have uh, property owners or developers uh, in Pleasanton who want to build high density residential development right now? Yes. Okay. All right. Any, anything else on criteria one? I'll, maybe we can I have on. a little bit, but oh, I was I'm trying sorry. to let everybody else speak. Sorry, anybody yeah. else? Yeah, I, I have a question. Um, this is question number one, deals only with site size and infill. It is all presumed that all of these sites are presumed to have all of the requisite infrastructure of water, sewer, and power. Is that correct? No, they, they don't necessarily have to have them. Uh, the state will consider those sites to be more viable if they do. Um, and if they don't have those, uh, that infrastructure available, the city will have to include a program in the housing element that explains um, how we're going to address that deficiency. Well, that sort of close to what I was thinking about. Um, I sat with Mr. Dolan on the East Pleasanton for three years plan. And when we looked at the property over there, I don't, I don't think, is that fitting under the category of infill or because it's inside the urban boundary or? Yeah, I think an infill, an infill site would be by definition within the urban growth boundary. It's, um, there's a definition you can see in the, um, in the outline of the criteria that's a bit more precise than we're showing here on the screen okay. about, you know, it's 75% it's surrounded by urbanized development. There's a number of different parameters. Um, that sort of help you to know that it is an infill site versus versus a greenfield development. Um, UGB is not included, but that's we expect that all of our sites will be inside the UGB. We would not accept a site outside of our UGB. So for Neil, uh, they were going to have to build everything from roads to sewers to schools to you name it uh, on the East Pleasanton. Okay. East Pleasanton, yeah. Did you have anything else, Neil? No, I'm good. Uh, that was that really was my main thing in section number one, whether East Pleasanton would be infill. It was interesting to hear uh, Becky's input on the quality of the soil over there. I don't remember it being quite that bad, but okay. Um, All right. Um, thank you for that uh, for that feedback. Should we, are we ready to move on to number two? Yeah. Okay. So these are these are all transit related um, criteria. 
uh, fairly self-evident, just basically saying that sites that are within um, walking distance, essentially of BART or of uh, bus stops um, or adjacent to um, where there's a bike facility nearby um, or near a freeway on-ramp are, are, are you know, more, more favorable sites for, for consideration in our, in our update. So that's what these are really all about. Are there any comments on these criteria? Uh, Zarina. Oh, sorry, my hand is up. That's all. So uh, 2C and 2D, I guess, would be um, because we don't, we have this on the on the bus route or board route. So that would be the first criteria that I would say. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's go with Carlene next. Yeah, it seems to me that A and B are in a way redundant. If three fourths of a mile is close enough to a BART station to be a walking distance, then shouldn't we just include that instead of half a mile and a three fourths of a mile? Of course, you know, the closer we are to BART station, more desirable, but if three fourths of a mile is a reasonable distance to walk, then why not just keep one instead of adding additional points to a location that would be you know half a mile and also three fourths of a mile and so it's going to get two points instead of just one. Yeah, I mean the the, the, main, the main reason for it, um, good, really good question, is is sort of extra credit, right? If you're you know close-ish, you get a point, and if you're really close, you get an extra point. So it's a way just to give extra recognition for the sites that are a bit more proximate to to BART by sort of doubling up um, the points that you can score in that category. That's the the reason why it's it's presented like that. And the site being within half a mile of freeway on ramp, is that more of a concern of traffic jam, traffic issues for the city, or is it is it a consideration for people who are going to be getting on the freeway because the majority of homes in Pleasanton are not half a mile away from freeway? So is that an important criteria to have? Um, it was included in the fourth round, um, and Brian, correct me if I'm wrong. I believe it was just really about giving people convenient access to the freeway so that you're not driving, you know, all the way across Pleasanton, for example, to get on 580 or 680 to, to go to work or to, you know, go and run your, your weekend errand at, at uh, well, not at Costco at some point, but at uh, some store that doesn't exist in Pleasanton. Um, that was the thinking there. So you're not contributing to in-town traffic by giving people um, direct access to the freeway. Uh, okay. Um... I want to come back to that one, but let's see what Neil has to say. Oh, he, he's got up. Kate? Yeah, it was, I'm going to... Oh, I'm up. sorry. Neil, could you put your camera down a little bit? I couldn't see you there. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Does that help? Yeah, I, I was uh, I was a little bit perplexed as to if each of these gets a point, so to speak, and if the site is, for example, within a half mile of Bar Station, that's one point. Um, is, is that a considered a good point or a bad point? Uh, that's, a that good, is, that's a good point. More points good. are points are good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, personally, I personally wouldn't want to be within a half a mile of BART. So, is that not a personal choice, or how am I am I not interpreting this correctly? Well, the, so from a planning perspective, um, and also from some a lot of the um, the grant funding, like the TCAC funding that I mentioned. It, they place a very high emphasis on transit proximity because it provides opportunity for people to, you know, to, to walk and to take transit or to bike and take transit. So um, it's in there for two reasons, an environmental reason, as well as a, a competitiveness reason for, for, for funding for, particularly for affordable housing projects. Okay, well, but it also adds to the noise and pollution level and people traffic issue, right? Well, I think the, the argument is if you don't give people, if you don't place housing near transit, you have no choice but to drive. And so the, tr the traffic impacts of placing a lot of housing far from transit is greater than putting people, I mean, it would concentrate more development around those transit stops, but it's mitigated to some degree by the availability and access to transit. Okay, okay. so the paradigm is to reduce car traffic. That, yep, yeah. that's the, that's yeah. the that's theory. The, that's the paradigm, all right. Okay. Yeah. So I want to take a turn here for a second because this is one of my pet ones. They just uh, redid the city center San Ramon plan up there and they're putting in 4,500 units of which half are in the criteria we're worried about. And there is no BART or anything else like that near it. 
And the same thing happened with the downtown in Livermore. So both of those projects would have been at a disadvantage here because we're giving them points for being on a BART, near a BART. I thought we were trying to get people to work in town. And then yeah, let me so put the last part, part in for just a second. There's also an experiment going on up in uh, Dublin with the Livermore Amateur Valley Transit with self-driving bus from the BART goes, I don't know if it's a half a mile or a mile, but if we're looking forward 10 years, you know, and we're going to, I would expect in 10 years, we're going to have more self-driving shared awesome. vehicles, whatever you want to call them. But, you know, if, if we can do this the way we did it in 2010, <laughs> or we can look for some new technologies and demand that they be built in. I do believe that there is uh, mobility built into the city center thing up in San Ramon, with some vehicles that, that move people around on the property and to other places. Anyway, that was my comment in this space. So. Uh, let's see, uh, Kate. Thank you. Yeah, I, I sort of wanted to, I don't know how to phrase this right. I, I kind of have the same concerns in terms of, I understand um, being close to public transportation is, is good, but I also think we just have horrible public infrastructure <laughs> for transportation. And there's all sorts of things like ride sharing subsidies where you can, you know, there's people that can have access to Ubers and Lyfts for, you know, they could get subsidized for those things. This is a little bit, you know, outdated. If it's from the criteria from, you know, sort of locked in at the state level, okay. But it just seems for us, it seems a little bit like we're gonna cut out whole swaths of the city because it's just not near a BART station. The ACE train is not mentioned here at all. I don't know why we're not asking about, um, you know, BART and ACE. ACE is, you know, a pretty important route too. Um, and so I think that this section is the most concerning to me because I understand the point system, but I also think it leaves a lot of patches out. Um, and I do think transportation is different now. You know, there are, you know, ride sharing and the last mile, um, you know, like wheels thing that they want to have for the self-driving last mile to get to the BART station. I, I just think we need to consider this maybe a little bit less than we used to. Okay. Uh, you know, the, it, the you feel the, trans the transit factors are perhaps a bit overemphasized among the among the criteria. I think so, and I think that um, just how strict they are in terms of the distance. Um, you know, I would say you could be within a mile of a BART station, not qu three quarters and a half mile. I would like to work in ACE train here, um, whether that's with A and B, if you just rephrase it to be BART and or ACE train. Um, yeah, and then extend it to be, you know, I think a mile from a BART station is perfectly walkable. I think a lot of people can do that. Hey, um, I think that's five. included. I think that's on the last page on the map when they said 2C and D, that includes the BART and the ACE. Sorry. Yeah, I think ACE has made it clear that they won't be adding another station in the, I mean, if we wanted to get rid of the one we have, but that's not going to happen. So. Mm -hmm. All I'm saying is that I think that should be a consideration for the, um, you know, for a transportation option. It's just not called out here at all. I think yeah. the issue with ACE is that there's just not enough trains. Um, you know, it, it's, um, there's only, I don't know if it's two in the morning or and two in the afternoon. That's what it has been. Well, it. It'll get back to four after COVID, but we were we had peaked at four. Yeah, I don't know if I'd even worry about that. I mean, I think that as far as the population goes in public transportation, the housing may have to come, the transportation may have to follow. I mean, there may not be a bus route out to East Pleasanton. There is, but you know, hypothetically, if we have to develop in East Pleasanton, then there'll be bus routes to go out to East Pleasanton. I, I just think that there has to be something that this can't be the leader. It should maybe be the follower a little bit more. Um, I think some of the criteria is important. I just, I, it just seems a little bit too restrictive. Well, um, the, the half mile is definitely included in the tax credit criteria. Mm -hmm. That's sort of 
been the standard and yes, maybe we have ride sharing and maybe we're going to have um, self-driving things, but that's still traffic. Um, yeah, the, the, the half mile radius is is the sort of commonly accepted kind of walking, you know, the sort of distance that most people will tolerate to walk in most weather conditions. And if you make the radius larger, and as Brian's suggesting, you know, we, the, the, those future technologies are a little bit uncertain. I mean, we have, you know, scooters and all these other things, right, that are possible. But right now, um, the lowest barrier is is walking and a half mile is a is a walking radius um, in sort of the planning the planning world so that's right. so three quarters in a mile that mile is not walkable not considered walkable it, it is it, I mean for I mean for a, a, a person who likes to walk yes I can walk a mile easily and most of you probably can too but there are folks who it's it's once you get beyond a quarter or half mile it's it's just more it's just a, it's an obstacle it's a barrier to mm -hmm. It feels like a longer distance. So mm -hmm. the the problem with that thinking is is uh, to save a couple million now, even if it's in credits, these houses are going to be built in five and ten years, but we're going to have them for fifty. All right, and you know it's it's like trying to get in the old narrow city streets or the over in Livermore. They have streets that are way too wide, you know, and you can't fix it. Uh, if, if we don't want to put any density except near the BART and except near the freeway, uh, we're assuming that, that the problems that we have solved now are the only problems that are going to solve for the next 50 years. And yeah. excuse me, I, I saw that thinking on the Civic Center library site. You know, they were acting as if the next 10 years is important, but this thing is that Civic Center library would be there for 50 years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You know, and, and I hope we don't lose sight of that in this housing uh, update because it is going to be a long time. We'll all be gone. Yeah, so I, I did want to bring up the next slide. Just, just I mean, I, 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 I think what I heard is, is from some of you at least is, is that perhaps an overemphasis on transit. But I did want to say, you know, those are a handful among many criteria in the list, right? So we're looking at a whole range of factors. Transit is one, but there's also others that that do look uh, more holistically. And, and, and that's part of the effort, right? Is to be kind of balanced and holistic in all of the criteria that we're applying to find the ones that perform the best against, um, the, against the, 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 the most of them as possible. <clears throat> Anybody else? Tony, did you, you have your hand up? Yeah, what happened to the num number two? <laughs> oh, sorry, I thought we were going to number three. Right. Alan, if, uh, if last chance for a really quick question on number two, and Alan, we're going to move us on to number three. Okay, so 2E site is, a, what, what is your definition of a bike facility? Um, a bike facility in this definition includes any one of our various classes of uh, a bike facility. So all the way from the class one, the, the most, you know, the most generous uh, to an on-street bike route. Um, we, we decided to make it fairly broad. Um, it could be narrower, um, but all of those provide biking opportunities. So, um, so it would apply to being adjacent to any, any class of bike facility. Okay, so I, I see on the uh, agenda that was sent out, you have those in there. So it, it explains, okay, it's class one, class two, class three. So that's what you mean by bike facility. You mean bike lab. Like, yeah. Uh, yep. Okay, yeah, that's what I wanted to uh, cover. Thank you. All right. Zarina, on, it's on section two? Three. Okay, then let's Perfect. let her talk about that first. Okay. Yeah, so I, I did want to refer you also, you know, there, there is a bit more detail in your agenda packet description. So this is just sort of a, a synopsis, so it's a little bit more readable on screen, but um, there's more definition if, if you want to look at the follow along in your packet as well. Okay, anybody else have comments, questions on three? I have one comment. Uh, just that we have a... Um... We have nine elementary schools, so I think half miles realistic. We have um, three high schools, uh, but we also have three middle schools. Um, so I was just thinking that middle school, like high school, should be within a mile, um, since you know there's only three. There's not nine like there are for elementary schools. Um, so that was just a comment in terms of the distance to a middle school because there's just not 
as many of them as there are elementary schools. Should be more like the high school. I, I well, think to you think that uh, a parent will let a middle schooler walk a mile. Yeah, that happens right now. I, my kids are in middle school. No qualms about that. Do you think that's the norm? Uh, according around Pleasanton Middle School, I don't see any issues there. There's a lot of kids that walk that. They ride their bicycle, right? A lot of walkers too. Yeah. I um, I I'm think just saying, also, logistically, we we don't have you know we don't have that many homes that would be close to an existing middle school. We only have three properties in the city. It's just not even you know. Well, some of these sites that might be in the business park area or might be in the mall area are going to have enough condos, apartments, or something that they're almost going to need another school. All right, so I mean we're gonna have to work with the district on that. Everybody says we don't do that <laughs> before, but I suspect attempts were made. So it, it, I don't know if that needs to be a big criteria. Again, I know how it looks on a GIS report, but in reality, if you're going to put 300 next to Walmart and 300 next to Macy's, somebody's going to have to build a new couple schools. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, and, and that's covered in E, I think, yeah. um, you know, we'll have to get to that when it comes to it. I, I just wanted to comment that for middle school, I just thought the range should be larger than a half mile. Um, I think Charlene. we're taking a look at, Alan. We're taking a look at? Yeah. Sure. Can you explain, E, what that means? I, I wasn't clear on that. Um, so basically, if the boundaries of the site are within a half a mile of a park or of a publicly accessible open space area, you would get a point in this criteria. No, E. No. Oh, that. I'm sorry. E, I apologize. Um, so um, we we understand from, from PUSD and from other discussions that there are several schools that are already impacted with uh, too many students today. Um, you know, I'm sure you're many of you are familiar with the efforts that PUSD is making to, um, you know, provide a, a new a elementary school. Um, so the idea here was that you would be negatively scored for uh, a housing site that is within an enrollment area of a school that already has capacity issues. So not not adding to the burden. Thank you for that explanation. I would think that that information could potentially change on a yearly basis. So anything that you evaluate on the day you evaluate it by next year, that could be old information, no? It does change. And we know from the demographic reports from PUSD that the numbers fluctuate. They fluctuated last year. You know, we saw changes with COVID. Um, so we'll we'll just do our best to consult with, with, with PUSD and really uh, hone in on the schools that seem to have the most persistent concerns about capacity, um, perhaps not the ones that are marginal and might sort of float in and out of, um, you know, being over undersubscribed from year to year. I think the ones that have significant over enrollment have been pretty consistent, even though they move up and down. Uh, it's, it's been the same schools. Um, and I've been here 13 years and I, I keep hearing the same ones. Okay, uh, Zarina. So I was thinking mainly on uh, 3A, B. Uh, I think the schools are important, all A, B, C, D, and F. I think parks are becoming also important, especially if people are living in apartments or condensed confined spaces. So they that's a requirement that need to be, have a public park or area that they can go out and get fresh air, whatever. So uh, I think uh, having being close to groceries and not a 7-Eleven, so they're not, you know, it's more accessible if they don't have cars, that's a primary concern. Being close to elementary school, so if they're going earlier or coming late, at least the kids are taken care of. Um, I'm talking about high density homes and uh, for low income families, uh, you know, I think, uh, yeah, I think high school, I was surprised to see that the existing, uh, 
high school is the new criteria for a requirement for arena. So I think schools will be the first and then the public will be, uh, F will be the next criteria for me, so. Anything else, uh, section three? Hearing none, Ellen. Um, so, so section four, um, you know, we really have five categories. The fifth has sort of multiple points underneath it. Um, uh, noise exposure by things like proximity to the to the to the freeway and high or high high volume streets, um, uh, air quality issues, uh, emergency response, and then natural hazards, which are all sort of mapped throughout the city and to avoid placing high, higher to be higher density housing in those sorts of uh, more hazardous areas. Pretty straightforward. Any questions here? I, I'm going to have one, but anybody else? I've got, I've got one. Sure. What's C mean? Um, so the air district, uh, which is back mid, um, specifies um, buffering distances from um, high volume streets and, and roads uh, within which there's an elevated risk of um, health hazards just associated with things like diesel particulate matter and things like that. So that's just a way of saying, if you're in those areas, um, typically we need to do more of a in-depth analysis of risk for a project has to do a more in-depth analysis of risk. Doesn't mean that there's a risk that's substantial, that housing isn't appropriate, but it's just an indicator potentially of, of more, you know, more health um, exposure, health hazard exposure. Um, based on those kinds of conditions. So you know where these areas are? Are they defined? It's, yeah, it's based on on roadway volume. So we know what our road volumes are, and that's and that's how we would define this. Sort of, I'm going to add on to that. Um, between our consulting people and our ear department, Ellen, um, are you going to be making some GIS maps to say? You know, here are the areas that just doesn't make sense, and here are areas that. We're, yeah, we're, we won't be doing it quite like that. What we'll be doing is is when when all of the list of, of the prospective sites is is available, we'll be looking at every one of them, sort of overlaying them on these various maps. But we're not doing the exercise of kind of creating a composite maps of, map of constraints and saying only the stuff that's not within those constraint areas can be considered because that would probably. Uh, obliterate any opportunities for housing in the entirety of the city. It's just a way to, you know, just to evaluate and weigh relative um, quality of sites against one another without I mean, necessarily saying that any one of these is a, is a fatal flaw or, a, you know, makes a, makes a site completely unacceptable. There may be some conditions for some sites that that's true, but at this level, we're just sort of really trying to do kind of a initial screening and ranking. When this is done, would a developer know or would they have to come to planning first or co community development? I'm sorry, I'm mixing up Mr. Dolan's okay. old job. <laughs> um, yeah, when, so, so the, the, all of this is, is basically right part of our site selection, but in order to develop a project, well, two things. One, we're gonna do a CEQA analysis on our housing element sites, which will be much more technical than this exercise. It's another one of our um, pieces of analysis that will be brought into the picture to help inform our site selection. Um, and then secondarily, when a site comes forward, uh, they may have to do additional mitigation. So you can imagine a site that is uh, close to the railway line. Frequently, we ask them to do triple glazed windows because there's railroad noise, right? So you can get to an acceptable noise level with mitigation. Those are going to be determined on a site by site and project by project specific basis. But again, this is about sort of broadly constraints, sites that are you know better or worse, relatively speaking, to one another, and just a way to do this initial ranking. Thank you. Anybody else for section four? Um, oh, sorry. To, yeah, to, well, I, I mean, honestly, I, I might have missed my window for the utility. This might be more of a utilities than an environmental impact, um, because I guess I was thinking about water and energy. So water um, in terms of having, um, 
you know, I know that you already had a question in terms of does it already have existing utilities or water access and all that. Um, uh, and just making sure that, you know, whether it's like, you know, uh, the irrigation or the landscaping or something that would make it um, more environmentally, you know, friendly in terms of water usage. Um, but maybe that's more of a construction thing versus like a site criteria. Um, we, we will look at broadly water supply um, during the CEQA review, and we're required to do what's called a water supply assessment that looks at the increment of demand associated with development of these housing sites mm -hmm. um, and make, does an analysis of whether or not there's sufficient capacity uh, in our system to basically accommodate those, those units under a number of different um, you know, drought and dry year scenarios. So that's part of the technical CEQA analysis um, that will you know, be done holistically for all of the sites versus on a site-by-site -site basis. The first question was really about, are there pipes Right, yeah. are the pipes in good shape, or do they exist adjacent to a site? Versus uh, the more global question of water supply. For yeah, because I guess I was thinking in terms of new construction, and is there a way to make things more efficient? You know, mm -hmm. in terms of what people used to use, but now um, to make it more um, stretch further, and then also for energy or power. I just didn't know if new construction going forward would be opted into EBCE or East Bay Community Energy. Is that the default, and then people yeah. could get into pg e if they wanted, or is it? Yeah, one of one actually one of the um, the policy items that is included in the housing element is is energy because because the state recognizes that your energy use is a you know environmental factor, but also a cost factor for for housing, and so um, we do have to look at energy efficiency as as kind of one of the policy considerations for the housing element in general, okay. uh, recognizing that as a constraint um, that exists. Yeah. So that's a policy thing. It's not really a site thing. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Each Thanks. project is um, reviewed for water efficiency, energy efficiency, but that doesn't happen until, you know, the project zone. Somebody has a development proposal, and that happens right now, and I mean, even outside of uh, the housing element process for any development. Yeah, good, good point, Brian. And, and, you know, as you know, the, the cap is moving forward and includes a number of um, policies that are obviously aimed at reducing the overall energy consumption of the community, including some, um, you know, residential energy type of measures. Thank you. Uh, Serena? Uh, are we in the 100-year flood zone area? Do we know? There are some in Pleasanton, so we'll look at those as among the criteria. So yeah, so I guess that would give a point if you're not, if you're uh, building on the areas that are not in the flood zone, I suppose. Correct. Carlene? Are we on number five? Sorry, I... I think we're still on... Oh, do you... Oh, okay. okay. I can go back to four. Because shows five, six, and seven, that's why. I, I'll, bring, I'll bring four back up. I'm sorry, okay. I, thought, I thought we were wrapping up on four. Oh, okay. No, I had a question on five, so I'll just wait. Okay. Thank you. All right. Five. <laughs> so impact on trees, biological or historic resources, fairly self-explanatory, just really saying, you know, if those things exist on a site, um, not again, that it, it can't be developed, but it might be one, a site that's more constrained or one we might want to think a little bit more carefully about whether or not it's an appropriate location for, um, for high density housing. Okay. Uh, Carlene, you had a question there? Yeah, my question was who um, defines what significant is? Is that going to be based on the size of the lot or how is that determined when time comes to make that? Um, so, so there exists um, a number of resources that we'll, we'll look at, including for historic resources, we have um, some inventories and listings of potentially historic buildings. We'll also look at sort of just generally kind of older, older housing, um, kind of do a broad survey of those sorts of things. Um, for the environmental criteria, there is mapping of um, broadly of, uh, throughout the community, of the, throughout the city of where sensitive, meaning protective, protected resources exist. So wetlands, species that have, you know, endangered status and that sort of thing. Um, and those are mapped um, 
uh, by the by the state, and we can refer to those and use that as a metric for you know for for consideration. My question um, was in regards to the tree removal. It says significant tree removal. So how how is that determined? Yeah, I mean this is probably an area where it strays a little bit into subjectivity, but you know. I, I think the way we'll approach this is to say you've got a site and it's covered in beautiful oak trees and you've got a site and it's got a parking lot on it. We're probably going to look, I mean, I'm taking a very simple example, but and there's probably, I'm sure there will be shades of gray, um, but, you know, just using Google earth and other tools will make an assessment just of whether or not there appears to be a lot of mature, mature trees in particular on a site and ones that we would likely want to save in a, in a project. We do have a definition of something called a heritage tree. It's based on a certain size. Um, and that is a, a very commonly referred to distinction um, in any development approval. The planning department deals with that issue constantly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Neil? Um, yeah, my question was 5C. Um, why would we not want to encourage a site if it happens to be close to uh, a historic resource like an old barn or an old train station or something? Is that what that means? Yeah, the, the city, um, you know, has... If it would eliminate... Right. We don't care if it's near it as long as it doesn't impact the setting, it's would it require the demolition of such a resource? Oh, I see. Impacts, okay. I mean, um, other than El Viso and the Centennial House, what are our historic resources? Um, there are numerous historic homes located uh, principally in the downtown oh, area okay. and in a few Any other locations as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else? All right, let's move it on then. Six. Uh, six, um, height and mass compatibility. So this, these are really criteria about, particularly for higher density projects, which are likely to be larger and taller than, um, than others, whether or not those um, types of buildings will be more or less in scale with what's around them. And so you can imagine a couple of different settings uh, Hacienda Business Park versus, you know, the Fairlands neighborhood, right? Very different settings. And we might look at housing sites uh, in those sorts of contexts a little bit differently. So this is just a way to evaluate both um, relative height as well as relative intensity of development that exists in the surrounding neighborhood. And then just in general, criteria C is to say, if we have a choice, uh, placing a high density housing project immediately adjacent to single family homes, might be a less desirable, um, might be less desirable location. Mm -hmm. So is 6A, is that a requirement? Is that a RENA requirement or just a city requirement? So you want it for the aesthetics not to be one story higher than the existing? Yeah, this is, so the, the standard is one that we have exists actually in our downtown specific plan as a way to sort of evaluate design compatibility. Um, so this is not a state criteria. This is really a locally, you know, locally important factor. I would say is residential compatibility. And our our consultants, when we when we showed them this list, they were sort of like, you know, there's throughout this process, there's going to be in many cases difficult decisions to be made, and you know, it's going to be trade offs and maximizing compatibility. Not saying that there's there's not going to be a new residential project next to existing residential development. Um, but where we do do it, it's going to be thoughtful and, uh, and well-designed and cited in a way that sort of is, you know, transitions well and things like that. So uh, this is one of the more subjective, I, I think, areas, but which we try to apply an objective standard with this height differentiation. Thank you. Kate? Yeah, I think that the um, subjectives, my concern is having A and C. Uh, I just think we're in for a world of hurt if we have to, I, I want to be considerate, but I think C is the one that I'm more concerned about. Site so is not adjacent or across the street from one or more existing single family detached residential homes. I, I mean, don't we have other processes in place already, architectural review and 
you know, other guidelines that the city does anyway, any, anytime something's going to be built. I just think, see, if we keep that as criteria, that could kill off projects. Um, and I, I don't necessarily think that just because we're going to have single family on one side, I'm trying to think of a specific neighborhood, but I know when I've walked around town, that already exists today. I, I just don't, if it's the right place and it's done, you know, with the right solution, um, it could be done. So I just think having that criteria uh, for C is, is sort of, it, it sort of eliminates things before it's even an option. Yeah, again, none of, none of these are, are sort of a fatal flaw, you know, yeah. so, so there, it's just a waiting factor. Um, but yeah, this one is, is one where, you know, but we know there's, you know, great community concern about that sort of compatibility of development. And so wanting to be sensitive to that um, in our selection was important. Uh, you know, it was important in the last cycle. It will continue, I think, to be important to the community in this cycle. But you're, you're quite right. Uh, Commissioner Dugan, it's 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 um, we do have and we will have um, objective des design standards for all of these high density housing sites that will help to ensure to the extent that we can that these sites are well designed and, and do, you know, maximize their compatibility with what's around them. So they're not just plopped a big, ugly building right next to small scale, um, small scale homes. I also wrote down, because I had read the, the checklist earlier today, I wrote down a, the adjacency to freeway. I thought I wrote down, and I'm sorry if I'm missing a section, I thought it was in this section six, um, but I thought there had been a criteria, something about a proximity to freeways. Um, it, I thought I read, what I wrote down was a question mark adjacency to freeway meeting. Um, it seemed like if it was close to a freeway, it, it wasn't going to be a good site. Um, well, we have a criteria about adjacent or proximity to a freeway on ramp, which is a sort of transportation item. Um, there was a criteria in the fourth cycle that I think was about um, uh, looking at sites that are com existing commercial sites near freeways and deciding that perhaps we would be foregoing a commercial opportunity for housing and using that as an evaluation criteria. Um, you know, I, I, maybe it was an older one then. Yeah. So that was one that we recommended for removal just because okay. there's, there's going to be other ways in which we can evaluate that more, more effectively than, than that particular criteria at this point of the analysis. Okay. Thank you. Um, Tony. Yeah. I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to understand C, C. So site is not adjacent to or across from a residential. So does that mean like if I had a corner lot on a main street and across like on a corner, right? One side was more of a main street and the other side was a residential street that's going into single family homes. And on the other side of the little of that bigger street, there's all residential. Does that mean that does that meet that criteria there that it's would, wouldn't get a point because that's where it's located. So, so we we this criteria, which was carried over from the last cycle, um, was you can see those words residential, collector, or local street, and those are the smaller scale neighborhood streets. Right. Uh, it doesn't exclude something that's across an arterial, which is like a larger, you know, hop yard is an arterial, big big street, right, where where you have enough distance and separation that those kinds of adjacencies. Are less important. So this is really looking at the neighborhood scale streets and homes directly across one of those one of those smaller local streets. So it'll be within a uh, neighborhood for the most part. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, Zarina. I think now that we have we have we are understanding the whole process. What do the experts think? What are the criteria that needs to be considered? I think we haven't got an input on what they think. Thanks, the consultants. Do you, do you, uh, thanks for giving our consultants a, an opportunity to earn their <laughs> earn, earn their earn their money tonight. Um, uh, David or Jen, did you want to add um, anything to your? Well, let me just give some structural background that may be helpful. Um, Pleasanton has, as many of you may be aware of, 
a non-standard development process. Um, and it's a hallmark of the community's development um, history, and it seems to be an important part of the community's identity. And this is the PUD process. So if you've worked in other cities, you may have seen places that have more static zoning and are less likely to depend on the use of PUDs or planned unit developments as a method for guiding growth and development in the community. I'm not saying one's better or worse than the other, but the PUD program uh, uh, approach provides, um, because it's non-standard, certain challenges in meeting the requirements of California housing element law, which is a highly technical and very specific process. So what this effort really allows Pleasanton to do is to maintain its preferred method of controlling growth and development in the city and, and, and evaluating applications for development over large parts of the city and not um, run into problems in California planning and housing element law, like for example, a spot zone or choosing sites that in a way that is arbitrary or capricious. You need to have a methodology. At the end of the day, this screening process will have to be further vetted through uh, requirements, uh, again, of the housing elements, which are issues about uh, densities, uh, site sizes, um, issues about affirmatively furthering fair housing, and a whole variety of other considerations. So while this uh, granular analysis is, is a good discussion and fruitful. It's not the final discussion on sites, but rather a, 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 an approach that allows us to sort of fit the Pleasanton way into the standardized requirements of state housing element law. Hmm. I mean, isn't almost everything big a PUD around here? Yes, that's that's our understanding. And that's not good? No, I didn't say it was good. I didn't say it was bad. It's just different <laughs> than the way most California communities operate. And as a result, okay. we have to have some different uh, tools to identify sites than you might in uh, cities that are uh, have conventional Euclidean zoning. Euclidean, okay. <laughs> uh, Euclidean. I get it. I yep. get it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, any other questions in this space? I have one that's sort of related, but I think I'll save it for the end. I'm, uh, I've, got a, because, I've got pardon. a quick question, just a quick sure. question. definition. How do you calculate floor area ratio? Um, so floor area ratio is the uh, ratio between the square footage of the parcel and the square footage of the building that sits on the parcel. Oh, okay. All right. Simple. Okay. Yeah, it's pretty simple. Yeah. Okay. Uh, interest in sight. Yeah. So last but not least, um, and we talked about this a little bit at the beginning, um, the idea that, you know, sites that have an interested property owner um, are going to likely be more, more viable or more, um, uh, have more basis in our case to HCD that they're appropriate sites for inclusion in the housing element, especially for the non-vacant sites, for the sites that have something on them already where the bar is a little higher um, and the burden of proof is a little greater for the city to prove uh, prove vi viability and feasibility in the, in the housing element cycle. So that's, that's why this criteria is in there. Yeah. So there are one or two companies talking, but Okay. Well, I mean, one, one of the um, tools that we're going to be using to help identify sites is properties about which staff has been approached over the last, you know, two to three years. And we, you know, routinely once or twice a month, get someone coming and knocking at our door and saying, what about, right, a housing project here? And what we've told almost all of those developers is, interesting idea, but you need to come back through the housing element process and have your site considered more holistically with, with all of the all of the rest of the sites. We're not gonna look at these one by one and in a piecemeal manner for rezoning. 
Um, so we actually have quite a long list of, of, um, of properties and uh, sites where we know there's active interest, um, more, than, more than just a couple. Um, and those will be included in our, our initial inventory for consideration. This includes like faith-based places. Yeah, that, I mean, that's an interesting one, Kate, because we haven't been approached by, by any churches or faith-based organizations. However, the state certainly recognizes that those provide unique opportunities for partnership, right? Because you often have large properties, they're owned by a, you know, a nonprofit, a, a you know, religious organization that has a different, uh, different profit motivation, perhaps than a private landowner. And so there's been some really, you know, fruitful partnerships in other communities between uh, churches, for example, and, and, and affordable housing developers. So we would really like to explore some of those ideas um, through this process and, and opportunities that might exist on some of our okay. church sites. Mm -hmm. and nothing proactive. Right yes, we will be, as we did um, in the fourth round, we will actually be contacting various property owners and, and gauging their interest. Okay. Anybody else? I have a question. So um, is the policy, is this the city's policy that they're not going to you know, work on the affordable housing or high, highly density, high density housing until the next arena cycle or the next big development. And, um, you know, because I just learned from today that, you know, the city was approached by multiple developers, but then decided not to pursue or allow permitting or whatever. I just want to understand the process. Um, no, the city the city is processing permits um, on sites that have zoning for housing. Great example is the um, housing project over at the mall on one of the one of the sites that was identified in our last housing element. So we worked uh, very uh, cooperatively with Simon Properties, who owns that, when they were advancing a project a couple of years ago that stalled because of COVID. But they're once again back, and we will continue to process and bring that project forward. Um, so if it has existing zoning, if it's owned for housing, then yes, we're continuing to move those ahead uh, in this cycle. It's really the sites where rezoning is being requested um, that requires that more deliberate conversation um, and, and you know, consideration of sort of the pros and cons of various sites across the city. Okay. I don't see any other questions. I, I have a couple of points. Does anybody have anything that they didn't think was covered in the criteria? No concerns. Okay. Maybe I'm the only one. <laughs> uh, three, I think just comments are little things um, and not in any particular order. Uh, again, looking through, it's called City Walk up in San Ramon. It's their 25 year plan, but it's a gigantic PUD. <laughs> Uh, they build stuff, then they build, they're going to build a bunch of houses. They made it clear they're going to have 500,000 square foot units, meaning, um, oh, nuts, I just forgot the word. Uh, usually you see them in cities where, where it, it, you don't even have a bedroom. You just have a my, my, micro unit. Yeah. Occupancy. Studio? No. Uh, not studio? So. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to play 20 questions. I should have wrote it down. It'll come back to me in a moment. But anyway, there and the uh, Stockman's Park says they will also have uh, some of these small units. You know, so I, mean, I think here we never think of building anything smaller than 1,200. 1,200 would be very small. But uh, Maybe it'd be nice to let the developers and the people know, get used to it. We're going to have to do, do this. Uh, number two, uh, how do we put into a housing plan that we want some of these to stay rentals so that they won't you know, get sold as turned into condos, then the price goes off the chart again. And once again, we're faced with the problem of uh, a single teacher can't afford to live here or a single manager in the park. What, 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 is, what can be done to ensure that we retain some rental additional above and beyond what we already have? Anything? 
Well, we do have a condominium conversion ordinance that provides a process. Um, I will tell you that I don't think we've processed a single one in the last 13 years. Oh, okay. From apartments to condominiums. Um, okay. We're still, market conditions are not such yet, and you'd think we'd be getting there, that people would actually build condos that look like apartments uh, with the intention of making them condos. Um, yeah. You know, some people think that that is, you know, it's a great first time home buyer opportunity. Right. Um, the market just hasn't brought them here. I think some of it is that when people move to a suburban community, um, that's not what they were looking for. Mm -hmm. Well, I think since density is going to increase, we're going to have to start looking for it. But yeah. And my my last thing is um, uh, early when I came on to the Housing Commission, uh, Cottinger was torn down and rebuilt. Um, what's the schedule for Ridgeview? If is when does that, you know, and I know there's a, what is it, a company managing it. If we wanted to increase density there the way it was done at Cottinger, and I'm talking about in the next 10 years, not, not now, but if the city came up with a, you know, somebody came up with uh, several tens of millions, is that a possibility? I suppose it's a possibility, but what they're really working on right now is resyndicating to raise money to right. do- We voted on that, yep. Repairs. Um, and, and but, just get it back to, you know, what it should be. I mean, um, having I mean, yeah. conversations at all about adding units. And I, I think it's fair to say that Ridgeview in its current state is miles ahead of, in terms of condition and livability than the former uh, cotton or cottages, yeah. which were really at the end of their useful life. Mm -hmm. And we and there's a there's an important policy piece in the in the housing element about preserving the existing rental housing stock, you know, that we recognize that rental housing is is the some of the most affordable housing in, in the city. Um, and affordable certainly to a much larger um, uh, section of the, of the population than, than for sale housing. So preserving that housing stock with re whether it's affordable or market rate uh, with rehabilitation or uh, other things is, is an important goal of the housing element too. Yeah, no, I, I was only thinking that if Ridgeville's, I think it's two stories right now. If it was four, we could double. <laughs> but, okay. Great. Uh, as everybody felt they've had a chance to talk and Steve is, or Ellen, do you have a next step or direction for us? Can I ask one more thing? Sorry. Okay. I, I wanted to address, uh, you know, smaller units for in the process of uh, this, this, this arena process. I'm going to make sure that we address when we are looking at affordable housing, it has to be smaller unit, not you know, so people can actually condo, uh, not townhouses perhaps, uh, so that they could purchase as a, you know, first time buyers, young couple, and then they could, uh, as a step to get into a single family home in the future. So I wanna make sure that in this arena cycle that we do pencil in some of those units, not just all apartments, condos, or uh, single family homes. Does that make sense? That is, has anybody talked about Tiny homes, small homes, condos. Uh, yeah, that's actually a, a theme that's come up at a, a couple of recent meetings that I've been at um, for housing is sort of this idea that what the, the unit sizes that tend to get built in Pleasanton are larger and so thus generally less affordable. So uh, some cities have been proactive about doing things like limiting the maximum size of units. I'm not sure that's a place the city wants to go, but it's certainly something that could be talked about as part of our policy discussion. Yeah, I think that that is all up in, in the policy discussion that we will be having about density, unit size, um, and that's definitely something we'll be talking to the commission about. Yep. 
affordable, affordable, affordable by design, I think is sort of the term that tends to be applied to those smaller. I, types the, the word I was looking for before is studio. There are studio ah. apartments. Yep. And I'm, are there any studio apartments in Pleasanton? I, I wouldn't know. I mean, um, yeah. I, I, I think the recent projects have, have included some mix of, of, of studios, you know, once, but, you know, on the other end of the spectrum, you know, the, the state also wants us to try and make sure we accommodate family housing, especially affordable family housing. So larger you know, three bedroom units. So both ends of the spectrum are probably important. Um, and definitely there's, there's something, there's a product that the market wants to build. There's probably a little bit more in the middle. So, um, you know, we, we can, we can guide some of that through policy as, as Brian suggested. I mean, studios could be an ADU. I mean, ADUs are the kind of the new studio, I feel like, because they're a lot of them are just sort of smaller units like an ADU on a pro, on a bigger property. Certainly most of us have only heard fear about ADUs in this town. I haven't heard anybody saying that it was a good idea. Well, people that people that are building them love them. <laughs> so yes, yes. We, we, we usually have a lot of folks coming in and, and wanting to wanting to build them, and it's really just yeah. the, na- the neighbors who often have have concerns. So. I owned one for seven years. We rented it out. Never had any issues with our neighbors. Yeah. Totally fine. Don't understand the fear. Yeah. Um. So so thank you very much for your input tonight. Um, Hold it. Can you oh, hear me? Oh, sorry, Tony. Hey. Let me interrupt. Okay, so is anybody proposing that what you're talking about is gonna modify the ranking that we're talking about? This is, what I'm seeing is the next step and maybe the step after that, we're gonna start getting into what's gonna go on these play, or maybe we won't even get into that until we get some developers proposing stuff. Yeah, it's it's gonna be um, a next step of the process. So essentially next steps are, um, we'll, we'll be taking your comments and reporting them back to the planning commission tomorrow. Um, they will um, you know, take this under consideration and make their recommendation to the city council. The city council will have the final word on this list of criteria. And then as I, I suggested, um, you know, we are busily working behind the scenes to really pull together that, that, that comprehensive list, list of all possible and potential um, future housing sites that aren't sites that aren't zoned for housing today. And then those will be, we'll, we'll take these criteria, we'll do a bunch of mapping, um, a bunch of analysis, um, assign the points to each of the sites, um, bring that back for discussion. But part of that conversation will be much more, I'll say much more real in terms of numbers that we're trying to solve. Um, and discussions about very specific, you know, as, as Brian said, density, you know, types of types of housing product that might be able to work on different on different locations at different densities, um, and sort of integrated with a broader policy discussion about how exactly do we select sites and 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 place an increment of housing on each of them that ultimately meets our RENA allocation. And that's a, you know that's going to be a complicated discussion. Um, but it will start with this very first step and just to help to kind of point us in some sort of a direction by applying these criteria that that's a really purpose that's really the purpose of this exercise. Um, so we, we'll be back with a much more uh, focused discussion that really starts to look at specific sites and how they rank and, and asking the community and our commissions and the council to uh, pick the, the top contenders really that sort of meet as many of these criteria as possible but also might satisfy other policy requirements as well based on size, density, and that sort of thing. So those are the next steps. Before that though, we will be coming back with um, our uh, background report, preliminary report, which will have some of that data in there about um, kind of housing needs in the community, analysis of our existing governmental you know, programs, our policies and procedures that, that are around housing and also an evaluation of existing policies that we have on the books in the housing element um, for you know, discussion and sort of initial conversation about update and other ideas about how those maybe could be improved or, or changed uh, to better meet our housing needs. So. I know it dribs out for a couple of years, but is there any useful information gonna soon be out from the census? We, we just got our, the very first, it was this, the information initial, initial release came out a couple of weeks ago. Uh, that's focused on uh, population numbers, uh, racial, you know, dem- demographics and that in sort of, mon- sort of racial, racial and ethnic categories, um, housing units and uh, households. So 
if you want to check out the Department of Finance has a has a place where they've aggregated um, statewide and city and county specific data. So we do have some new data for Pleasanton. Be happy to share that with you um, at our next meeting. And um, our consultants are busy working, putting together a really detailed set of uh, background information about what our current population profile is in a number of different areas uh, from different family sizes, you know, seniors, age of population, jobs, jobs and housing match and various other things. So there'll be a big kind of data dump that's happening. Um, we're bringing to you in September. Um, and that's oh, okay. interesting sort of deep dive into housing needs in the community as well. Sounds good. So a lot, a lot going on. <laughs> Hey, you guys got solid jobs. <laughs> well, we're going to keep you, you guys busy too. So. And we appreciate your work and the consultant peoples. Thank you guys. I think uh, we learned a lot tonight. I hope we gave you some useful stuff. You did. Thank you. Uh, other than that, I think Steve, regular meeting next month. At this time, we don't have anything else scheduled, right? Yes. So as uh, Ellen mentioned, uh, we will be bringing the housing element background report to you guys. Okay. All right. Then let's adjourn for the night. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Hi. Good night, everybody. Steve, do you have a chance? Can I talk to you about the for a second? So we, we 